Wednesday, everyone, and thanks for joining us today for the Platt Institute's Talking Tech in the Nebraska Legislature. Today, we'll be discussing issues such as how to improve rural broadband access, whether data privacy should be regulated, and if there are tech companies that are just too big. These are issues that are on the minds of state legislators across the country. Today, we'll connect you with two experts who can help answer these important questions in advance of the coming legislative session and discuss how good tech policy can be crafted. And now I'd like to welcome Billy Easley, Senior Policy Analyst at Americans for Prosperity, and Will Reinhardt, Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Growth and Opportunity at Utah State University. Just a little bit of housekeeping, we are recording today's seminar. And also, if you have questions for our panelists, do feel free to submit those through either the question and answer box or through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, let's get started. Uh, first question, I'm gonna just throw it out to both of you. So either of you can jump in and answer this one. How can state legislators be forward-looking with infrastructure policy when it comes to things like rural broadband, 5G deployment, or other issues? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can kind of kick it off. So obviously, thank you very much for having me. And you know, thanks for, for kind of spurring on this conversation. You know, I, I, when it comes to any sort of infrastructure project, and when we're talking about infrastructure deployment at the at the state and really the local level and the municipal level, there is a lot that's going on. Um, and to be very honest, I think we should recognize very clearly at the very, very beginning that it is um, kind of difficult to know necessarily what a specific region needs to do. And that, that that's because each of these different areas, each of the different markets, you know, even the market of, for example, uh, Lincoln is slightly different than the, than the market of Omaha, that even those sorts of things matter a lot when you're talking about local deployment. And so the thing that I've mentioned over and over again in talking to state legislators is that they really do need to get in the weeds and get dirty on this. And we know that, that attending to those kind of really nitty gritty questions and kind of trying to learn what's going on at the local level and what the what the hangups are is is very important and that really is should be the first thing is doing what you might call like a search right a search for the problems that are existing in the state now i know nebraska in particular has been has been pulling together a lot of materials on this i know there's been some of these um you know there's been a lot within within the legislature on uh, talking through these sorts of problems when it comes to broadband i know in 2019 there was a series of hearings on this so this is something that's very much on the top of mind of of not just not just people in nebraska but really writ large the, the across the united states especially now that we're talking about covid um but again as i would say you know i, I just i hope everyone recognizes at the very very beginning this is a tough problem it's tough to kind of break the broadband economics especially in rural areas you know, I've, I have, um, I'm actually finishing up some work right now on these, these cost structures and trying to figure out where and how state, for example, state um, broadband loans and grants could be, be, uh, be supportive or not supportive of all of this. And, and I think that the one thing that I find consistently is that rural regions really do struggle with this problem of cost, such that in, you know, in, in you know, the FCC a couple of years back actually did some estimations on this. And they found that, you know, when it comes to these, these really tough to connect homes, you could be talking as much as $90,000 to connect the premise. Um, and we've seen, I've seen a lot of, of costs that are, you know, about $10,000 to connect a home to broadband. That's a lot of money. And, and when you're trying to push that out over, you know, over a, um, a time span that is effectively, you know, however many, 30 years, sometimes it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make economic sense to do the, those, um, those sorts of supports and, and, and um, those sorts of infrastructure projects. So the first thing, of course, I, I, as I suggest is it's a tough problem. No one has a good solution. Um, you know, the United States isn't alone in this problem. Every single country has been facing similar sorts of issues. Even dense, dense, wealthy European countries have been having very sorts of similar problems. So I would just recognize that this is an endemic issue and then try to build on successes from there. The other thing that I've suggested a lot, and this is something that I think does actually apply pretty closely with Nebraska, is that there does seem to actually be um, kind of an interesting and large lift that occurs with broadband when it comes to uh, farming communities in particular. Primarily because it seems that, that, that broadband does, in fact, give farmers access to larger markets. And when you look at kind of the, the total pantheon of, of potential areas that could be benefit from broadband, it's actually 
that farmers in particular that seem to have actually a benefit in in the data and they're really the only re, the only industry that seem to actually benefit from from broadband so figuring out how that broadband might get to certain regions and into farm communities i think is really really key and really really important um, there's a lot that's been done by, uh, you know, the farmers bureaus. I know, you know, I'm from Illinois and there's a lot that the Illinois farmers bureaus has done, Illinois farmer bureau has done. And a lot of Missouri has done this as well, connecting with local, you know, local farmers, figuring out how they're using the technology, giving them, uh, knowledge about the usefulness of it. All of these things, actually, this kind of demand side that we don't talk about as much is I think a key part of all of this. Um, there's a lot more obviously to be done. There's a lot that we can get into that, but, but at least for me, the, the, the key right now, I think is that, that, that state policy really should be focused on this demand side of things and figure out those communities that, that do have some issues with connection and, and figure out where, where those problems exist and why is it that they're not connected. I just want to echo Will's comments generally and say that, look, there are some things that states can do. Um, and Nebraska has, has already taken some of those steps and a number of other states have as well. Um, some common sense things that could be done with regards to, you know, making sure that there's a dig once policy. So if we're already building out infrastructure um, that we're setting down the fiber optic cables already, so we don't have to go through the costly process of um, breaking up roads and other infrastructure projects again, just to lay down a cable. I think that's a common sense thing that, that we could do. Um, also, uh, following the lead of the Federal Communications Commission and making sure that it's easier for people to deploy small cells and other broadband instruments that will connect people to the 5G and, and uh, the next generation of, of wireless uh, broadband. Those are good things. Um, but I think we also just have to be realistic that, and accept that there really isn't a silver bullet issue here. There are other countries, as Will mentioned, that have uh, been really dedicated to closing the digital divide um, a, on a you know a countrywide basis. Tell me if I'm wrong here, Will, but I think Australia was one of them, um, and it didn't work out, right? It was ex prohibitively expensive. Um, this sort of state-based view that well, if we just put enough money into the project, we're going to be able to reach everyone, um, and you know that just doesn't work out. Um, I used to work for Senator Rand Paul um, and would uh, visit Kentucky uh, quite a bit often. And one of the key things that they tried to do um, was this program called Kentucky Wired, um, which had perfectly good intentions, right, about connecting rural counties in Kentucky and making sure that they had the, the economic benefits of having access to broadband. Um, it, it's been years. Uh, it's over budget and has not managed to um, meet any of the expectations that taxpayers of the legislature thought that they needed. So I think what state officials can do um, is um, really make sure that um, cities and localities are not you know, putting excessive fees on um, internet service providers and others that are trying to deploy out um, 5G uh, small cell devices, first of all. So, when 5G is fully available, it'll be easier to, to access. Um, Dig wants deployment. I'm not entirely sure whether or not Nebraska already has that rule in place, but I think that's a, a pretty easy common sense thing that, that uh, states and transportation agencies can do. Um, and uh, the other thing that I'll say here is like, look, while there might be a, 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 an economic issue, <laughs> a return on investment issue, with regards to building out broadband to, to every community. One of the neat things about working in tech policy is that sometimes tech development can fix these problems without government intervention. Um, I think that satellite broadband, SpaceX, Amazon's Cooper project, I think those are still you know years out before they're fully gonna be deployed. Um, but if, if satellite broadband is, is really able to, to meet its promise and be a competitor, um, to some of other the other broadband services out there, it would be a really good um, alternative to to rural communities um, and and help them access this these uh you know broadband generally. Um, well, I'd be excited to, to hear if you have any issues with what I said. No, 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 I think you're exactly right. I mean, wireless these kind of wireless services they, they always feel like they're you know ten years out. Um, but we might, I mean, there might be something with Starlink in particular, you know, I've been following that a lot more closely than, than a lot of, than a lot of the other projects, but you're exactly right, Billy. I mean, a lot of these things are, are new and very exciting, but again, these sorts of problems are kind of endemic. 
Um, as far as the dig once bill, I, I ended up looking through a good amount of the code and I'm not sure of the of Nebraska state code. And, and the one thing I would also suggest to people that are really interested in this, their uh, Pew has put out a really, really good uh, database on all of this. And it goes through effectively every single state and what they've done. And it's a really, really good database that kind of goes through all these issues. And Nebraska has done a lot of the things that we've talked about, you know, the, um, I, from my understanding of, of what I've seen, you know, with that database and some of the other resources, I, I'm not sure that Nebraska has done dig once, but they did do a small cell infrastructure bill last year. And there's been some other elements that they've, in, you know, tried to basically solve some of these permitting problems, which seem to be pretty endemic. But as you said, that, that there's just this really, really tough problem of, of getting, um, of getting wired connections into homes. And, and now, especially with COVID, it, it's become, you know, obviously very, very top of the mind. I, I would say that, you know, as kind of, as a research economist, uh, kind of first and foremost, the one thing that we do see again, is that even with these large scale deployment projects, and there's some really, really big municipal fiber projects, the big one you're talking about, which is what I was gonna bring up was Kentucky Wired, right? Kentucky Wired is like this, this is a really good example of how not to do things cost overruns many years, I think it was almost a five year delay of, 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 um, of, um, of effectively of deployment. So all of these things are, are just tough. And even when you look at the data and you look at how communities are doing and faring after these large scale municipal fiber projects, they're not as, they're not as transformative as you'd think that they would be. The, the, the changes that typically happen within a municipality you know, you might you might get some kind of advancement on on uh, broadband adoption. You know, maybe a little bit on broadband adoption, but for the most part, it doesn't really seem to change all that much incomes. And and interestingly enough, especially when it comes to rural um, rural areas, what ends up happening when you get super fast broadband is that rural area tends to then you know, transform and come closer and become more economically connected to whatever the metropolitan area is. And so if you're really trying to ensure that people have access and you're trying to make sure that all of these things are important for rural communities, which again, I've, you know, we've, I've been working, I know Billy's been working on this for years, that there is this really weird sort of problem, which is that the more you actually build these services, the, the more that the, um, the rural regions themselves become more reliant on high industry and kind of, you know, high services, the broadband enabled services, and then they start substituting, you know, retail and they start substituting kind of the manufacturing jobs, interestingly enough, at the local level. So all these things are, it, there really, as you said, is, there is no silver bullet in any of this. Um, the other thing that I would suggest highly on, on all of this is, um, you know, there have been some surveys, conduct surveys, if you can, if you can conduct surveys to figure out what your, you know, what your non-adopters need and what your regions need, because oftentimes there is, and especially when I, you know, read these reports and read these surveys, you see overwhelmingly people in rural areas, um, and, you know, having talked to a number of folks in rural areas, it's, it's pretty, pretty similar, all of the demands, right? There's a very obviously a very serious problem with heroin um, um, for most of the uh, for most of the Midwest. Um, but when it comes to actually like what is it that they need, you know, um, universally it's it's you know training. I mean, I'm looking at Utah, which is where my organization is based out of Utah, and and training comes up universally, and, and it's education and and access to jobs and access to training. But when you talk about broadband and super fast broadband, it really doesn't come in in the kind of the the top tier demands for local communities. So in that sense, these things, these projects tend to be very politically salient. You know, they they get votes, really and honestly. And that's something that that obviously you can make a lot of political wins, but at the end of the day, being a transformative technology isn't there in the way that that I think a lot of the the boosters of these projects would suggest. That means that there is a much harder work that needs to be done. And, and that's something that, you know, if you're interested in working on that, I'm, I'm more than willing to sit down and talk with people about how to do this and how to think through this. Um, but it, it takes a lot of nuance. And typically when you read these reports, especially I know that Nebraska, I think there was a recent report that came out of Nebraska on just what can happen. And it was, you know, like everyone else, it was super long. You know, the, there's a long detailed list of, of how these things actually could positively work for the state. And it's, and it's as you would expect, there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of local decisions, tough decisions that have to be made, and none of it is easy. And I, I don't, and I really don't envy policymakers that are trying to deal with this, this very critical problem. Um, there's a question that's been uh, asked here, and I'm going to just 
defer to either of you, whoever would like to jump in and answer this. Has there been much consideration for investments in rural-based tech companies that could potentially absorb the initial cost of getting fiber to a smaller rural city or town? thus having the benefit of providing tech jobs as well as a smaller cost to getting fiber to homes. So that that idea has been out there for a, a bit and mainly it, it seems to actually work the best when you're talking. Um, it seems actually that model seems to work the best when you're talking about healthcare and education and not necessarily a large uh, manufacturer or some sort of service provider. So the idea is to have some sort of like anchor institution as it's called. Now, the idea here would be an anchor institution or as a company or, you know, a large provider. But it, it seems that the easiest way to do this is typically to have a college town, to be honest, or, or some sort of smaller, um, you know, educational institution, higher educational institution that is doing, doing um, research and investment on their own. And this is kind of a cross investment, right? It's kind of a, it, it, it's kind of a thing that happens because you already have that kind of embedded, um, that embedded institution. So this idea of trying to connect to these embedded institutions or these anchor institutions is something that a lot of people have, have tried uh, to solve. Again, you have very, very similar sorts of problems that there are these kind of regional spill, spillover effects that, that effectively orient the region to that kind of center and core and may orient it towards more broadband service. But at the end of the day, it doesn't, it doesn't really change um, incomes in the way that you would hope it's not it doesn't really seem to to move the needle all that much so those sort of anchor institution projects do exist um there's a lot of of institutions that are trying to trying to work with that but again it's just not easy and i would say that you know the other project i mean you know this is something i've been looking at very closely the the lincoln project allo is a very interesting project when it comes to this which is this kind of open access model where you have, you know, a, um, a, a broadband build, and then you have, you know, commercial entity on top of that. That model is probably the least bad of all models. But again, I, my expectation is that it's probably not going to budge the needle all that much on, again, on economic outcomes and the stuff that, that I really do care about, which is getting people back back to work and, you know, increasing incomes and, and having more flexibility in work. So those those sorts of things are are very much top of the mind, but I'm just not sure that it's that it is solved very easily. Can can I add just one quick thing to this point, which is um, um, Will is very economically focused, which which is great. I am I am horrible at economics, so I'm glad that he's here to give that <laughs> give that perspective. I think one of the things that legislatures really need to think about when it comes to rural broadband is what is our objective here, right? What services are really trying to connect people to, right? If it is a matter of this idea that if we connect people, we are going to have an economic revitalization in these communities, uh, that's, that's not going to happen. That is, that is not a guarantee at all. If, if, you're, uh, if your concern is more particularized, right, if it's about, well, we need to make sure that um, kids are able to um, access internet so that they could, you know, get instructions, right, um, or provide very specific services, I think that, I think you can tailor your broadband policy in a very specific way to achieve that objective. Um, I, I, the only reason why I bring this up is um, a lot during the rural broadband conversations, I see so many different objectives that legislators want to achieve. Um, and I think it's really important, just like in every other issue area, to have a specific objective that they wanna do and see if there's a more narrowly tailored way to do that than you know, beyond you know, spending a ton of money uh, or building out an entire um, deployment project. Cause sometimes there might be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, real quick, uh, Will, you, can you give us um, information as to where viewers can access the report you mentioned briefly about Nebraska? Oh, yes. Or yes. I can, I can either, I can put it in the chat, but it is, it's, um, if you look up Pew and the, oh. it's a Pew state, um, okay. state okay. broadband okay. survey. Okay. Yeah. I can put it in the, in the link here. I'll, I'll go ahead and drop it in. Yep. No, we've, we've already dropped in. I just didn't know if you were talking about a separate report. So thank you so much. Um, all right, we're going we're gonna to change gears here a little bit. And I'm going to ask a, a question that I'm very curious as to how you'll answer. Are some tech companies just too big? That's, oh man, now this is the uncomfortable question, right? Um, so when we talk about big companies, I, the, the, the reason why we care about big companies and the reason why we care about large companies or a single firm provider sometimes 
is that they have typically a, a bad effect on, on prices, right? That they raise prices or they restrict output. So when we look for monopolies, and, and really when we're talking about monopolies, it's a single firm. Um, when we look at monopolies, that's the real thing that we care about. And, or we, we worry also about some sort of effect on innovation, you know, some long-term effect on innovation. That's a really, really difficult thing to just cogently express is that long-term innovation effect, right? Uh, but when, it, when we come and when we're talking about these big tech companies, this idea that having a large tech company, it, at least on the face of it, shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. What we need to be looking for are, are price effects or quality effects, which both, again, both of them are kind of hard to get at when it comes to uh, big, big tech companies. But for the most part, you're also talking about at least, you know, when we talk about the, the big tech companies, there are typically four that are put in there. You know, you have Amazon, you have Facebook, Apple, and Google. Two of those companies, at least for, for consumers, Facebook and Google, or, yeah, Facebook and Google, they don't really have consumer prices. And so what consumers actually get is a, is a service that they are consuming at, at what, you know, is a, at a zero price. So where the, at least in the larger conversation that's going on in, you know, in Washington and, you know, in the pages of, of your, uh, of your national, um, you know, of your national newspapers, a lot of the focus has been a lot on this idea of the advertising market and how has uh, Google and Facebook shifted the advertising market. That's a lot of where we're concerned about now. Um, it seems also that there is actually going to be a case against Google that's probably going to be dropped next week. Um, that will be on the search side of things. But again, every time that, or at least a lot of times that countries try to go after, uh, after these companies on, on the search element, it, it is, it's actually a lot more complicated and a lot more nuanced. And, and what you get at the end of the day is, well, sometimes these things help consumers, but it's really, really hard to actually figure out whether or not um, consumers are being harmed say, because Google preferences their own material, right? So, I mean, this is a big issue. Google is, Google, whenever you search for a product or a, uh, a, a, um, some sort of search for a product, commercial search as it's called, it's a very, very narrow niche part of the search market. And then the question becomes, well, is that, is that search through Google, is that competitive to Amazon? Which I would think that it's competitive to Amazon because people either go to Google to search for a product or they go to, you know, to Amazon to search for a product. Or is that larger product search, is that then competitive with, you know, the, the offline retail world? So is it more competitive with, with potentially other products that, that consumers are using? So there's been a lot of work that's been done in this space, and it's really just really, really tough. So that's all we're talking about there is Google, right? That's the Google case. Then there's the Facebook case, which is slightly different, which is about mergers and its acquisition of, of, um, of WhatsApp and, and um of um, what's up in Instagram. So that's all about competition. Amazon's is again, kind of this, this self preferential, this self preferential treatment. They're worried the, at least the, the authorities are worried on that. And then when it comes to Apple, you're in a completely different world. I can also send this through, through the chat. I, I did a bit of a preview on all these different cases. Each one of them is slightly different. They're pretty non-traditional. We really haven't seen a, 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 a court case and an antitrust case that's that really is very very similar to all of this before um i would say that uh, that one there is there's a lot to there's a lot to learn in this space which i'm still learning a lot there's a lot to the advertising market that i think that these hearings and there's a series of hearings that are going on and there's another one tomorrow at the at the federal level through the house there's a lot that, that these hearings have uncovered there's a lot that these court, court cases will, will be uncovering i would also that if you're really interested in this Take a very, very hard look at the actual court case itself. Don't, don't listen or don't read the newspapers if you, if you can do it. Take some time and actually read through what it is that, that the courts or that the DOJ is going to go after Google for. You know, read, read the actual primary material because oftentimes when you read through it, they give a, 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 a nuance to the argument that I think is, is, sometimes, is sometimes left wanting with descriptions of these sorts of cases because everyone's just trying to make, you know, trying to make an easy, um, an easy win for their side. Uh, the other thing that I would mention is that, you know, I, I, we've talked, or at least I've kind of ranted here about the problems of tech. Then there's this entire other question of remedies. Like, and, and that's really where I'm interested in a lot of my work right now is focused on is how effective has the FTC and the DOJ really been in their court cases over the years? This is something that effectively, despite having almost a hundred years, we don't know anything, we really don't know anything about how effective these agencies have been. 
So that to me, there's some early, there's some really, really good evidence through some researchers that I'm, that I'm working with that suggests that effectively there's only a couple of industries where it does really seem to work. And the big ones are healthcare and, you know, healthcare and, um, uh, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, and some of the more manufacturing and mineral sciences. But in a lot of the other spaces, it doesn't seem that those, that, that they're particularly effective at, you know, kind of rearranging markets or, or kind of making markets more uh, innovative. So there, again, I, you know, every single time I, I feel like I'm saying, you know, there needs to be more nuance to all these conversations. But when we talk about big tech, to me, there is this deep and really interesting nuance to all of this that, that again, I'm more than willing to, to, to send over materials and to talk to people more in depth about, and especially if we have questions about this, I'm, I, can, I can try to go through this, but there's, I think, a very, very um, needed nuance to all of this. And I would also say that despite the problems that these large tech companies do have, you know, and there are problems that I don't, that we really do need to address, despite all of those problems, they have still been successful companies. And I think that says something to what um, American private enterprise can do if it is, you know, if it was, if it's given the tools. Silicon Valley does have a lot of problems, but it, you know, it, it is really, really good about creating, you know, flat organizations and, and companies that can, that can shift really quickly. And there's, there's a lot of benefits to the system that I don't want to, that I don't want to give up because we're just trying to regulate big tech companies. So I, I would caution people who are interested in this one to figure out the very clear cogent problem that is that is existing with with these companies and then two figuring out the remedies if those remedies really would be beneficial and on both of those ends i'm i'm oftentimes just found very wanting in in our antitrust um and our antitrust enforcement agency which then puts it into a bit, a bit of a different space right maybe we're actually talking much more about regulation and when you look actually at europe there's there slightly different when it comes to regulation. And I don't really want to completely embrace the regulatory state of Europe, but, but maybe what we're talking about here isn't antitrust, but we're actually talking about potentially regulatory structures that exist at the federal level, which are slightly different, so. If, if I know this question was really for Will, but if you don't mind me just playing yeah, go ahead. a little of course, bit here of course. more. Um, I think one of the, the, the main issues is, look, is, are we discussing, is the problem that these companies are too big or is it because we have specific problems with what they're doing with regards to like privacy or speech on specific platforms? Or maybe we have a, this is actually an issue that popped up in the House Judiciary Committee uh, a few months ago. Um, a lot of legislators were concerned about how uh, the tech companies were sort of kowtowing to China's demands on specific products um, and, and services. Um, those are all issues that we can deal with without breaking up companies or making them smaller. And in fact, breaking up some of these companies might actually not fix those problems at all. If you break up Facebook because of a concern about how uh, Facebook has violated, you know, legal consent decrees regarding their privacy issues, then, um, well, how is going to have, you know, if we have three or four different regional Facebooks, does that necessarily mean that we're going to have better privacy policies? Probably not. Um, we already have tools in, in the toolbox, in the policy toolbox through the Federal Trade Commission or state AGs um, or Congress passing laws, who would have thunk, right, that can specifically deal with these topics rather than the sort of heavy handed approach of just breaking them up. I, I would also agree with that. I've, I've been very anti breaking up the tech companies. I think it's actually just a logistical nightmare. Um, and, and Billy actually really highlighted something I think that is, that is within this conversation that's the really like true nuance point, which is that, the, that most of the, if we're gonna call the successful breakups, um, they mostly have been with companies that are already kind of regionally fractured to begin with. So when you look at like the big kind of, I mean, quote unquote successful, but, and there's again, a lot of discussion over that, but the big, the big breakups that we typically think about are, you know, are Standard Oil and AT&T. Both of those companies were broken up regionally. The other companies and more traditional companies that traditionally have been broken up, but that were broken up by function, which is what we would be doing with Google and Facebook, those companies, uh, and the case that I go back to over and over again is American Tobacco. American Tobacco was broken up in, I believe it was 1911, if I remember correctly. The case was in 1911. I think it was broken up shortly thereafter. It basically didn't change the markets at all. There was really no change for, you know, um, farmers of, of tobacco leaf. They didn't really get any higher prices over time. There really wasn't a change for, for consumers. There was, um, you know, the, the market shifted a bit, but, but things really didn't change all that much for the market after, after these, um, 
uh, a- after the breakup. It wasn't until there was the kind of beginning of, of uh, regulation in the 1950s and in the 1960s with, with tobacco and tobacco prices in a different aspect, which was the Federal, Federal Trade Commission, that things changed a bit. But, you know, that was, what, almost a 30-year shift in between the two. The point is, is that when you actually look at a lot of breakups, you just don't get very much from them. You just don't get a lot of benefits from them, um, at, which then puts us in a, like I said, in a very different sort of conversation. We're talking potentially about regulation, a very, you know, very narrow targeted regulation. The other thing that we should be talking about and that I have been suggesting is, you know, the other, the other way to deal with this is to have a more holistic approach that thinks about, um, you know, you might not do a pure subsidy, but you might think about, okay, well, what are the other things that would be potentially competitive to these companies that you would want to be supporting through, say, government procurement, right? You, and this is what we've seen. You know, we've seen, for example, the government giving you know procurement dollars to to uh, to Microsoft in a way that you know, again, that's controversial somewhat. But there's other ways to ensure that there are competitive markets beyond just breaking them up and some of these other methods and other means of it, which is you know, procurement, putting, putting again, government dollars behind this, that, that I think is actually a much more interesting thing. You, I'd much rather not tax these companies and, and try to subsidize elsewhere. But again, I think that the subsidizations probably don't work either. And so you're in this kind of middling stage, right, where you can't really do all that much. But there's a lot that you can do politically. You can break up these companies and politically everyone wins. Well, except for the companies and, and probably consumers. Um, but, you know, again, it doesn't really do all that much. And there's a lot of costs and there's a lot of legal infrastructure. Um, you know, people like Billy and me are, get to go and speak about these things over and over again. But, but do consumers benefit all that much? Not, not really. It really is just, it's the, the effects are a lot worse than I think a lot of people would, would think. And when you look at the history of it, it really just is the case that they're not particularly beneficial. Okay. Well, Billy, you had, or, uh, had mentioned, you know, the question about is, are tech companies too big or are there other issues that instead of looking at the size of the tech companies, should we be looking at such as, you know, things like privacy and things like free speech. And so I guess my question would be, well, first of all, should free speech be regulated? And then if so, how on some of these social media platforms? I think free speech should be regulated and it should be regulated by the communities and the people who create those communities, right? Um, so I know what this is really going to uh, is, you know, Facebook, um, Twitter, these uh, very large social media platforms that are really, you know, integral to how Americans interact um, day to day now nowadays. Oh, and of course, if you're a younger generation than me, TikTok, um, right? Um, people are now a little concerned about, hey, look, if we're using this private um, entity to communicate, and if people are doing it often, um, then how do we know that the the rules are being applied fairly, um, that people's voices are being heard, and that um, the moderators or the owners of these companies aren't putting a finger on the scale in favor of one speech or another? Um, so the very first thing I want to say to this is, um, I understand those concerns, um, and I don't want to belittle those concerns, right? I this uh, The way that we communicate as Americans um, and the way we communicate globally is changing. And I can understand why people are concerned about that. Um, but what I would really warn people against is this idea that the government it would be effective at regulating this speech or solving these questions for us in a way that protects speech. And the reason why that I think that the government wouldn't be able to do that, um, and when I say the government, I, I don't just mean the United States government. There are a lot of uh, different countries that are also engaging in sort of regulation of free, free speech online both on a countrywide basis and uh, larger than that, the, the European Union has um, regulations on, on free speech online as well. Um, we saw how that fared when we had the Fairness Doctrine applied to broadcasters, right? This was, oh, I will, I will give them the benefit of the doubt. I think the, the FCC and um, the, the government had, you know, well, good intentions when they first started engaging the Fairness Doctrine, right? But when it was actually implemented, what wound up happening? You wound up seeing, you know, basically people with uh, political opinions that were not favored by one side, um, you know, being silenced. Um, you saw uh, presidential administrations using these uh, free speech uh, regulations as, as a cudgel for political purposes. 
Um, so I am, I'm steadfastly against um, government intervention with regards to passing laws or regulations that, that, um, that really sort of push companies like Facebook and Twitter into adopting uh, what are essentially free speech codes. Um, and one of the last things that I would, that I would add to this is, um, I think it really needs to be an analysis of the benefits of free speech and our um, really America's exceptionalism with regards to free speech. Um, a lot of countries do not have the free speech laws that we have. And I'm not just referring to uh, the First Amendment. Um, we have a culture and a legal regulatory environment um, that really says that the government doesn't have a strong role in regulating speech. And the benefit of that is that nowadays, um, if you're a social movement like Me Too, um, or if you're a conservative network or blog, right, you can find a way to go around the typical mainstream um, media filters that prevented um, these movements or our political opinions from getting a wide audience, right? There's a reason why some of Facebook's most popular links um, are conservative voices, right? Because um, it's easier to put those voices through a social media platform than it is through the typical like newspaper or mainstream um, filtering process. Um, so there's a lot of benefit to uh, the social media has generally benefited free speech. Uh, and I'm really loath to change the paradigm by, um, you know, imposing uh, government interactions on this. And then the last thing I'll say on this is um, I, I have to mention that the Trump administration has uh, really been pushing the idea that um, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, the Federal Communications Commission should pass rules um, that um, incentivize, um, you know, basically uh, political speech to be uh, to be uh, to be censored in some ways, right? Um, and I think that that is just not going to be an effective way to engage here. And the the last point that I will have before I start rambling on this is. Whenever you envision the government, whether that's on a state side or on a federal side, having power over, over free speech, um, note that that power will not stay with Republicans or Democrats, right? Um, always envision the person that you disagree with the most having that power. So if as a Republican, I'm concerned about what happens if we pass a free speech law that really gives the government the ability to constrain free speech on social media platforms. And, uh, and Elizabeth Warren is president one day, right? How is she going to use that power? I think we need to be very careful uh, and have that discussion before we um, sort of give government agencies that ability. Will, do you have anything to add or? I'm gonna let Billy take that one. I try not to deal with, I have enough <laughs> on my plate as, as is with the massive antitrust and, um, you know, moribund uh, broadband economics and issues. I try to stay away from free speech, even though I get pulled into it a decent amount. Competitive advantage. Yeah. The, and the one thing I also that I would probably also mention with all of this is, you know, I mean, Billy's done a great job articulating all these problems. I, the other thing is I think that people need to recognize is that everyone really hates Facebook, right? And everyone really hates Google. It isn't, it isn't just people on the right. People on the left really dislike them as well because they take down certain kinds of content. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of back and forth and basically no one's happy. So I don't know if that leaves us in a better place when it comes to free speech issues, but, uh, but effectively, I think it, it does suggest that we probably need to take a, a little bit more of a uh, holistic view and, and say, hey, probably, you know, and the thing that I'd also suggest is that, you know, I'm really reticent to see these companies being, let me say it like this, that it's really easy to interpret the actions of these companies as having some kind of interior motive when it may just be a bad spam filter, which is a lot of what this comes down to. That the filter itself, the automation, and especially the rush for automation by these companies creates problems that when you actually do talk to the companies and you have a conversation or you see their back and forth between some sort of tension that occurred with a politically hot topic and they're like, well, no, that was, that was our mistake. Like we, we put it back up and here's what it is. You, you don't really hear too much about that kind of the, the putbacks, right? Or you don't hear about these, these kind of, um, these, these uh, instances where, they, where the problem is solved, but you hear a lot more about the problem itself. And so I always, always suggest to do a little bit of follow-up and 
you know, try to read as much as, as possible, but also try to recognize what these companies are doing as well. Cause oftentimes there is at least some sort of context to it. Yeah. And I, I, the last point I'll put on there is, um, <laughs> despite my, uh, heavy pushback against any idea of government regulation of free speech on these platforms. That is not to say that I think these platforms are perfect, right? They have made tons of mistakes. Um, I think the biggest mistake that they've made, um, especially prior to, to 2018, is that Facebook and Twitter did a very bad job of making people aware of why their content was being taken down. Um, as, as Will said, that the number one issue that people of all political persuasions had was um, saying, hey, my content was taken down and I didn't get an explanation for that. Um, and some of this is because of automation issues and some of it is because uh, people just making really bad mistakes. These companies don't have, uh, you know, we're, <laughs> these are, these, they're not perfect. Sometimes uh, they make critical mistakes and they apologize for them. And I think that paradigm of uh, consumer advocacy about pushing them to be more upfront about why content is being taken down is a lot better than ending the conversation and handing it over to the government to decide. Um, I, I just think that'll be a, a much tougher um, and less uh, transparent way of, of engaging. Great. Well, now I want to talk, or at least throw out a couple of terms, and I know we had previously had conversations about this. Um, sometimes people are tempted to use the terms data privacy and data security interchangeably, um, but yeah. really they're, they're two separate entities. So my question, uh, you know, we'll start with Will, what's the difference between the two and what does the national landscape look like? Yeah, so yes, so data privacy and data security are these two big things that we oftentimes put together. Um, but data privacy is distinct in the fact that what data privacy really goes for is, is consumer rights to the data that already exists to them, right? So it's, it's, you know, I have certain kinds of data that are retained or at least controlled by, say, Google or Facebook. And so when I'm talking about data privacy and data privacy laws, which, you know, which we'll, I'll, I'll touch on here very shortly, when we talk about data privacy laws, we really mean you know, can I have information about that? You know, can I know what is being said about me? One, can I delete that? Can I have certain kinds of access and rights to that? So that's data privacy writ large, right? There's a, there's a separate but very connected sort of problem when we're talking about data security. And so when we talk about data security, we're talking about hacks and releases of information. You know, um, Nebraska Medical, I mean, this is the big one, right? Uh, there, I haven't seen any updates, but this was a pretty big hack. That's data security. And so when we're talking about securing databases and information, we're ensuring that, that those things don't get taken by, um, by nefarious actors, which is probably, you know, probably what was driving this. So those two things are very, are at least conceptually separate, right? This idea that there are some commercial entities that have information about you that you're going to have some sort of control over is very different than you know, here's a data, here's a database, and it was unlawfully accessed. So when we talk about, say, government surveillance, that's the sort of thing that we're oftentimes talking about is, is something along those lines, right? It's a data security question. We're asking whether or not there's, there's proper access to this data, which is different than kind of the deletion question. Now, you know, as, as Nebraska is like many other states, they've been thinking pretty extensively about this sort of problem. And there was, in fact, a, a bill that came up, and I know it's been kind of put on the back burner from my understanding, which it's very similar to, to California. And California gave a long kind of laundry list of, of rights to consumers. And that included, like I said, access to the information, the right to delete, a whole kind of litany of these sorts of, of um, consumer, consumer rights. Um, the, big, the big issue that I, you know, I, I'm not, again, I'm, <laughs> for better or worse, I'm always kind of interested in, and very uh, focused on the numbers. And a lot of what I've been trying to suggest and to try to, to, to suggest to people is that, you know, these things come with trade-offs. There is a very clear cost that's involved with compliance. California, if by their own, um, by their own uh, regulatory impact analysis, suggested that if they were fully compliant, something like 1.8% of all state domestic product would be effectively caught up in this. So you're talking about a bill 
that is among the most expensive regulatory bills that we're, we're currently talking about. And, and this is the area that I've been working again, you know, among other areas that I've been working a lot in to try to understand exactly what these costs are. Hopefully later this year, beginning of next year, I'll actually have a much better sense of this. But I, I want to be very honest, no one else really knows. No one else really has a good sense of how much these things cost. And that to me is a very big problem that you're trying to legislate and yet you really don't know the cost structure of it. Um, there is, again, trade-offs. There's trade-offs in this kind of thing that you, you see very clearly that, that the large companies pretty easily benefit from this. They're the able, they're, they can very, very easily um, you know, litigate these problems. They can, they can redo their processes to give consumers, individuals access to these sorts of, uh, this sort of data. But you know, the stuff that I, I see oftentimes that isn't talked about are, you know, and there's a great example in California, this, this guy who was a, um, a florist, he had a whole bunch of people that he retained information going back many years. And because the number of people that he retained information about hit the threshold, he was going to have to be regulated uh, under California law. And that's actually going to be a really, really interesting thing with California. And, and one way that I've, and one thing that I've suggested is that you might want to wait a little while just to see what happens with these sorts of enforcements. Um, because even though California seems to be somewhat narrowly targeted to tech companies, it literally affects every single major company that exists out there. Um, now, California has done a lot of changing in, in the definitions. So this might not necessarily, I, I know they literally just had a huge definitional change like, a, like about a month ago that I haven't done a super deep dive in. So this may have changed kind of somewhat on the edges. But what we're talking about here is a massive bill that affects literally all industries that do any sort of data processing. And at this point, that is literally everyone. All right. Well, um, so kind of want to take some time and, and look ahead. So, um, and this is open to either Will or Billy. What kinds of possibilities lie ahead for Nebraska? What ideas do you have for policymakers that are uh, more common sense and forward thinking in terms of tech policy, maybe things we haven't uh, necessarily talked about yet today. Um, and I think yesterday when we were kind of chatting a little bit in preparation for today, uh, one of you used the term uh, permissionless innovation. I loved it. That's Billy. Yeah. Uh, I'll take the first crack at this one. Um, so, I guess what I'll what I'll try to boil down your question to, I think, is you know what what will it really take for for people on this call for Nebraska as a whole to be a leader on tech and innovation policy, right? And what are the benefits of that? Um, and I think it's pretty easy to see the benefits, right? There's huge economic benefits, um, but there are also really good cultural benefits of of having people uh, in the in your state who feel invested in staying here. And not just investing their money and their time, um, but also, um, you know, creating products and services that we can't even imagine, right? Um, one of the great things about the United States is that the last 50 to 60 years, we've been number one with regards to tech and innovation policy. And that wasn't an accident, right? It was a combination of two factors. Um, our cultural stance on innovation, right? We have been a society that really welcomes people who think differently, who have an entrepreneurial mindset, who want to create the next big thing. And then because of our regulatory stances on these things, right? We have a regulatory environment that generally in comparison to, to other regions of the world, um, welcomes innovation, allows people to try new things, right? Um, and doesn't have a huge sort of top down uh, permission filled process to, uh, to determine when people can engage in the marketplace. Um, a good example of this is uh, the European Union's uh, regulations on artificial intelligence, for example, in comparison to um, the United States' principles on artificial intelligence, right? The European Union has a very top-down approach about how, um, you know, apps and other um, artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, products can, can, be, can be developed. And we just have more of a pr principled guideline that people and companies can use. And I think that's to our benefit generally. Um, and uh, I know that this is really a policy focused call, um, but I've tried to become more humble on this subject, right? Policy is important, but I think it's extremely important that we have a culture uh, and we have leaders 
and both the political and government spaces um, that are willing to support people who um, are trying to create a, a unique business idea, right? Or um, are engaging in services that um, we you know, don't have a model for, uh, or that our legal processes don't have a model for how to, to regulate. Um, I think that is actually more important than some of the policy issues because I can tell you how to create a, a model drone policy or to create you know, an autonomous vehicle policy, right? Like I can get you there if you wanna you know, have uh, the Jetsons sort of landscape, right? Of flying cars. But what's more important to me is legislators and business folks having the mindset of welcoming that sort of innovation rather than trying to regulate it out of existence. Um, so I'm just gonna put that, those principles into a box and then answer your direct question about um, what can Nebraska do? Um, uh, one of the models that, that uh, one of the issues that is really cool to me is drone deployment. Um, and how do we create um, a, a federal and state environment that allows for commercial drones uh, to be deployed safely and effectively, and that allows new business models to, to be created? Um, and this is an area where the United States, quite honestly, has fallen behind. Um, you look at other countries, especially in the third world, like Rwanda, um, where they have uh, uh, a drone regulatory environment that allows drones to fly out to people who have, you know, been seriously injured, right, and deliver um, medical supplies, blood, um, uh, you know, in some cases, even like livers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, other, you know, transplant things like that, right? Like, that's really cool. Um, and you can see why that would be so useful in a place where Rwanda, right? Where it's very underdeveloped in some instances and where there's a lot of rural communities, right? Um, but there are places like that in the United States and I bet in Nebraska too, right? That are also rural and underdeveloped who would really benefit from having um, drones being able to um, uh, either not just provide services like bring your next Amazon delivery, but also um, life-saving services. Um, the FAA has you know, finally started permitting and allowing some um, drone, uh, commercial drone usage, um, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. And one of the problems here is that we have a layer cake bureaucracy when it comes to drone deployment. You have the states and you have the FAA. Um, but what that also means is that states have a real opportunity uh, to develop their drone policies in a way that uh, can benefit uh, not only their citizens, but put them on the forefront of this technology. Um, the Mercatus Institute had a report come out uh, earlier this year that said that Nebraska was number 44 out of 50 uh, with regards to the states um, and with getting ready for, um, for drone deployment. So there's tons that legislators can do um, to, to put Nebraska on the map on this product. Um, and, you know, it's, you could have legislators and transportation agencies sit down and have an aviation advisory committee, right? To investigate how drone, uh, commercial drone deployment could help specific areas within Nebraska, right? So that it's not only just tailored to rural or urban counties, but both. Um, you could have uh, um, right of ways over um, public property like roads, right? Where it's, you know, sort of a de facto um, legal uh, pronouncement that uh, if drones are flying low altitude over public roads and public highways, that's perfectly fine, right? There's very easy things that we could do here. And um, it's not rewriting the book because there are other states that have done it. Um, and I think, um, I think the other thing that, uh, that needs to happen is that um, there needs to be a discussion about the privacy implications. Of, of commercial drones as well. Um, I, I don't wanna dismiss that. Privacy is one of my biggest and most important policy issues in my view, right? And I've seen some really good legislators sort of deal with that topic head on uh, to make sure that um, we aren't creating nuisances above people's homes, for instance, right? Um, so I, I would just say that there's lots of think tank folks like me and Will who um, work on state policy issues. And we do that because it's so much easier to get stuff done. Uh, when it comes to states. And, and we'd be glad to work with the Platt Institute, with the people on this call to, to identify those areas for Nebraska and work with you guys um, to create, you know, model legislation and other issues to, to, to put you guys at the forefront of these things. The other thing I would say on all of this, and this is something that I've been very interested in, um, is also this idea, and I know there's a bill that's coming up in federal, you know, in the, uh, in Congress, which obviously would have to pass, and that's its own sort of beast. But 
there has been discussion about state-based visa applications and state-based visas, which I'm actually very excited about. Um, this is something that I know, um, in particular, this is something I know that uh, I, I, have a, I have a buddy over in Iowa who's been really, really interested in this. I know that there has been for, for cities that, or for states rather that have had this kind of problem with brain drain that, that um, at least some sort of state-based application or state-based visa application is something a lot of them have been kind of interested in and talking about. So, you know, obviously that, that requires a federal law in order to go forward, but this idea that this, this might be one of the compromises that could, that could eventually come out of immigration if, if we see immigration uh, again um, at the national level. But it's something to think about. It's also something that, you know, to consider and, you know, to push your, to push your, your state senators and your, you know, your representatives actually on this issue, if this is something you think is going to be helpful, which I actually do think, you know, um, there's some, you know, there's some obviously very really important things you, you, that you would want to do, it mainly be done through the tax law, so you'd be like a tax benefit. But I, I think that, they, you know, there's still some, again, some, some things to work out with the, uh, with, the, with the very, very clear specifics. But this idea that states should be able to, you know, back a visa for somebody and they want to come that, that clearly, you know, they're educated, they're, they're working on X, Y, or Z topic, and they know that they're going to be potentially productive. I think that's something that the states should have the ability to do. And I think that generally is probably an interesting and probably a good idea in, in the near future. So that's something I would, I would suggest. Drones or Billy? I, I don't know drones too well. Um, we've also talked a lot about our organization. You know, so I'm, my organization is based in Utah. Um, we've done a lot of work and, and done a lot of work on regulatory sandboxes. So a lot of that is just giving flexibility. Um, I'm always interested to see where that can, that can go, you know, try to give, um, there was some stuff that we did on insurance with regulatory sandboxes. So all that stuff I think is actually pretty key. And that's, that's also an area where there probably needs to be done. There needs to be more done in this space. Yeah. Well, Willie should join us next week. Uh, we're, we might be doing a little discussion on regulatory sandboxes. I'd actually yeah, I'd love to be involved to talk to you about that. Um, after our webinar. Um, well, we're getting close to the end of the hour. And let's see here, I see something in the chat box. Okay, so nope, it's not a question, just wanted to make sure. Um, so, Will, Billy, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to join us today and, and share your expertise. And for those of you that are on and hearing some of these ideas, most definitely if you're interested in you know, having somebody in the legislature bring any of these policy ideas forward, do reach out to the Platt Institute. We'd love to get you connected with uh, Will and Billy. And, you know, we look forward to, again, further discussions um, to, to move Nebraska forward. So uh, just a reminder, today's webinar has been recorded. So if you'd like to go back and review any parts, because I know there's a lot of information mm -hmm today um, you know you're you'll be able to do so or if you'd like to if you know of a colleague um, that was not able to participate today you know share this with them they can get on the Platt Institute's website just plattinstitute.org and have access to today's recording and then lastly um, next week the Platt Institute will be hosting their virtual legislative summit that will be next Thursday October 8th and so if you haven't already registered Registered. You can access the registration to the Virtual Legislative Summit on our webpage as well. Again, that's platinstitute.org. So um, again, thank you, Will and Billy. We really appreciate this, and we look forward to seeing the rest of you next week. Thanks for having thanks. us. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Mm -hmm.